Hello and welcome to today's presentation on the impact of terrorist attacks on a tourism-based economy, as taken from the recent APEC workshop on focusing on strengthening tourism resilience against the impact of terrorist attacks. And I'll be your speaker today, Tony Ridley, CEO and founder of Intelligent Travel. Some of the issues that we're going to touch upon in the very brief session is going to be talking about tourism draw cards, the very reason that people are drawn to or consider a destination in the first place, uh, the influences, both direct and indirect, that help people determine or make choices when it comes to destinations and whether they continue in the wake of an event, um, and local economy impacts um, as a result of a post-terrorist uh, event. Um, time cycles, that is the, uh, the duration between certain events and demographics and um, considerations as they affect both the destination and buyers and tourists' decision cycles. Some location examples on, on what exactly has to, uh, occurred in terms of economics um, and impact to a local uh, tourism-based economy in the wake of a terrorist or attack or incident. Um, some tourism measurables. Um, that is the metrics or specific numbers that can be measured both pre, during and post a terrorist attack, very important for uh, removing some of the objectivity. Um, professional analysis and inputs taken from ourselves um, in our experience in dealing with these particular matters um, and also uh, looking as to whether terrorism plays the sole role in uh, a negative impact towards a destination or a tourism-based economy because um, in many instances uh, it, can, it can be the straw that broke the camel's back or it can be the tipping point, but it may not be ex the exclusive point itself. So uh, just a little about myself. Um, I'm a uh, travel health, safety, security and risk management professional uh, founding and establishing Intelligent Travel uh, a number of years ago and working in the industry for well over a decade. Um, I've had direct uh, supervision responsibility for clients affected by things like the Bali terrorist attacks, uh, the bombings, Mumbai terror attacks, bombings in Jakarta, um, the, uh, the hijack incident that was uh, unsuccessfully resolved by the government of the Philippines, um, and most recently I've been working sort of in Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Africa uh, for clients in uh, terrorism-based uh, economies and environments uh, with the protection of assets. Um, so I also have uh, expertise and experience on the terrorism front, not just the travel and the tourism aspect as well. Um, in addition to overseeing and creating a number of open source intelligence um, services, um, which I'll speak to uh, in more detail in terms of the analytics and evaluations, and co-creator of www.travelsafetydepartment.com uh, with Dr. Peter Tarlow, an international uh, subject matter expert on tourism, safety, uh, security, risk management and so on who lectures all around the world um, as well on this topic. Um, for any contact or information or follow-up you can contact me at support at intelligenttravel.com.au. So moving right along, the first thing we need to look at is the tourism as a market. Tourism is, has very much become like a stock market in terms of there's fundamental and technical analysis. Fundamentals being um, you know, the way in which business is conducted, the systems, the processes, the effectiveness and so on, and technical being the numbers. Um, and much like the stock market, these numbers form a very, very substantial component now in recent times to help make informed, objective decisions about how the crowd is responding. So if we look at terrorism in particular, correction, if we look at tourism over the last sort of 20 years or so, we can see it's, it's been a, a compounding growth factor throughout the world. Of course, there's been some dips, um, most noticeably sort of um, identifiable around the 2003, 2004, um, and then again in sort of 2008, 2009, some of this related to the monetary crisis, financial crisis. But also if we start to drill down into some of these numbers, um, specific economies and specific timelines have been directly affected by negative events, ranging from um, natural disasters, political instability, and certainly uh, a terrorism. Some of the Asia-Pacific um, forums uh, or areas, uh, we can see again over that timeline the, the compounding increase with some of them increasing by over 100% um, in that timeline. But also if we look at Nepal, um, second from the bottom there, we can also see that even though it's a rising economy for so many others, 
that they've been adversely affected in recent times by uh, the natural disaster, which all but devastated uh, most of the tourism industry um, at that time, but it certainly was quick to rebound. Um, so again, despite having specific trends and group uh, metrics, it's important to understand and look at these in isolation or in specific to certain economies because, again, there can be breakout trends or there can be elements that can um, be confused in the broader set of numbers that, that can be available. So obviously, um, most recently, this presentation was conducted in Bali as part of the APEC Forum, the workshop. Um, so we've, we've drawn upon Bali as an example because it's a very good example of um, the measurability that many destinations uh, are afforded now. So if we look at worldwide searches for Bali, and Bali is a, a very sort of specific term. Um, it does relate to some products and, and services. However, it's primarily destination based. But if we look over sort of the last 12 months, we can see there's an upwards trend sort of earlier in uh, the last couple of months uh, in relation to Bali. Now, this has got to do with some seasonal factors in terms of when tourists are traveling, you know, around the Easter break period, um, school holidays and those sorts of things. But it all depends on where those buyers um, or those customers actually originate from. But in general, we can see a bit of a breakout trend starting to occur. So again, this is not because there's been a terrorist attack or even a terrorist threat for that matter, um, specifically in recent times, but these are the, the numbers and the factors that we can be monitoring and looking at before an incident occurs. And it's important to understand what our baseline averages or aggregates are before the event takes place. So we can then start to analyze and look at breakout trends and have a pre-prepared plan to roll out in the event of a particular attack because it's too late to retrospectively look at it or consider these elements six months, 12 months, two years after the fact and talk about it and say, oh yes, it had a 60, 70, 80% drop in. That's no good anymore. This needs to be happening on a on a you know hourly basis, let alone a daily basis in order to ensure that the economy is, is uh, protected um, and also recovers effectively. So if we drill down and look at that information, who exactly um, or where exactly is the, are those searches coming from? So over the last 12 months, we can see the majority of searches related to Bali have originated from Indonesia. So this this now leads us to confirm that domestic travel for for Bali is, is a major component of that particular tourist-based economy. Second is Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, and then New Zealand. So it's important to understand, particularly in large geographical locations, that for some of these tourist-based uh, destinations, is that it's not just foreign travellers. It's not just uh, foreigners that are coming to these locations. A greater proportion of the uh, contribution to the tourist-based dollar um, could actually be uh, locals. So it's therefore important to segment and identify your, your communications message. Broadcasting is no longer an option. It's now narrow casting. And what that means is you don't have the same message for everybody to consume. You have a particular message for a particular demographic focused on either their geography, their language, their destination, or even their buying times. And when we then start to sort of drill down further into these details, and again, these are great for objectivity decision making. Um, you can see Ria from Bali is a breakout um, uh, process at the moment, and it's a very sort of asinine video that's created by some tourist that's measuring the, the beauty of, of Indonesian or Bali-based girls. I don't recommend viewing it. However, it's it's had significant significant coverage. Um, and has, has, a, has had a breakout trend um, as it relates to Bali. So again, it's important to understand what's happening on a routine basis or a non-terrorism related basis before jumping into either defend or communicate or respond to a terrorist based attack. Um, because as we know, if it bleeds, it leads. That is that the media are very quick to splash gruesome, uh, terrible news and facts around the world. Um, but it may also be the only time somebody has consumed or heard uh, about a particular destination. If you stop and consider how much you have taken interest of or how much you have heard of um, uh, of France or Paris in recent times, unless you're a regular traveller or unless you're um, routinely seeing that information, for much of the world, the first and only time that they heard anything about France or Paris um, or the Bastille Day events... Um, is was the terrorist attack um so again these these breakthrough uh, messaging 
um, has, is a double-edged sword in the fact that it could be the first time that it's alerted people to a destination, but it's also cemented a very negative um, anchor point for them to remember and go, oh, no, I'm not going there because of the one thing they remember about that destination. So if we now start to analyse and look at, instead of just worldwide searches for barley, let's look at barley searches within the last 12 months within Australia. These are general search terms. So we can see sort of the ebb and flow and some breakout um, trends starting to occur. But most importantly, we can now break that down into sub-districts and regions. So we can see the Northern Territory um, and Western Australia, then South Australia, Victoria and Queensland being the most populous based search locations for people with an interest in barley, um, with an objectivity to either travel or an interest or investment in um, that destination. And in particular, you can see um, the related query, Sarah Connor barley. Sarah Connor, no, no, they're not filming a Terminator movie in Bali anytime soon. Um, this is specifically relates to an Australian woman who's been implicated with her and her boyfriend in the death of an, of an Indonesian policeman most recently. So again, for many people, it was the only thing of note that they've heard or it's, it's that voyeuristic aspect of, oh, what's happened? Are they guilty? Um, and it's appeared most recently again in the news. Um, but that's the only thing they've been searching for. So again, um, it gives us insight into what it is that they're interested in. Um, and it's not negative aspects in terms of terrorism and threat and kidnapping and other horrible sort of things that some kind, sometimes can be related to a destination. This is purely voyeuristic news-based. And it's not just news in general. It's a very, very specific event that's dominating um, the interest in some of these locations. So if we look at Australia over the last five years, so stepping back a bit and looking at the trends, we can certainly see here some areas where there's been massive breakout areas. Now, again, this has been related to a number of factors and should never be considered just in isolation. It should be uh, verified in, in a number of sources or, or correlated between other interest uh, factors. But you can see some of these trends as they start to emerge and they break out is a serious point of consideration for providers, for suppliers, for those in the tourism industry, regardless of what the mechanism is. So certainly as it starts to relate to terrorism, then absolutely all eyes should be looking at some of these metrics and most importantly, they should be crafting and pre-preparing a rollout strategy for communications, not to fabricate a story, but to get ahead or to contain or to manage or be involved, simply be involved in the messaging because this is what the audience is consuming. This is what the buyer is consuming. So it's important to understand what it is that they're consuming um, and where it originates from and, and certainly whether it's accurate, whether it's qualified advice. So again, if we look over the last five years, Western Australia is significantly more or marginally more than Northern Territory, than South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. And this can be verified and backed up by the fact that there's so much interest in Bali from Western Australia, and there's approximately 10 flights a day from Perth in Western Australia to Denpasar, Bali, every single day. Whereas in a market such as Victoria, which has got Melbourne, um, there's significantly less volume, and there's only approximately two flights per day on an average basis. So again, you can analyse and can deconstruct why and how some of these commercial imperatives um, uh, come to be um, or the demand for certain markets by independently verifying. So again, we can see the volume, we can see it is supported by a significant volume in airlines. And again, the airlines are not in the business of um, oversupplying uh, a lot of empty flights. Um, these flights are being patronised, these flights are being filled, um, and there's quite a significant diversity in terms of service providers, again, all verifying the fact that that is a critical market. So again, crafting the message in terms of narrow casting there should absolutely be in this particular market a specific message um, and communication strategy and plan for perth for australians for the buyers of um, tourism and travel-based products in the event of a negative incident particularly a terrorist based one um, and this should form the basis of any destination in terms of identifying and having this narrow casting communication strategy, not just a one size fits all or welcome to such and such or we're open for business or we love you, we're not afraid. 
that doesn't work. It, it simply doesn't work anymore. Now, if we look at over the last five years, we can start to we can see now Travago, we can see luxury escapes. What really happens? We can now start start to see a broader um, terms of reference in terms of what people are looking for or been influenced by. But this is where it starts to become very interesting and requires further understanding by those who are in the travel and tourism industry, and certainly those who are supporting a post uh, incident communication strategy. And what this means is that the originator or creator of some of the content are non-official channels. They're non-official sources. Um, and in many, many instances, they're not professional and they're not, um, they're not uh, qualified opinions in many instances. So if we look at some of the results at this particular timeline that we're looking at, we can see 140,000 shares of um, someone's wedding in Bali. And we can see the distribution channel was primarily Facebook. So again, it's not necessarily news and it's not necessarily blogs or even videos in this instance or a combination. Um, it's a um, uh, Facebook, it's social media. And then we can see, you know, um, so what that means is someone's looking for an, a nine bedroom hotel um, with direct access to a swimming pool um, under 550,000 rupiah. So that's number two, and it's been shared 124,000 times. So um, we can see what it is that's being consumed. We can see the volume is where it's being consumed. But also we can then start to deconstruct that, and we can see who the creators or who the the, the sharers of this, this pivotal information is. And again, it's not CNN, it's not BBC, it's not the ABC, it's not a not uh, official news channels, and it's certainly not qualified opinion. Now, some of the content that they share may originate from qualified sources and experts in, in their field, but much of it is bloggers, and it's individuals, and it can be YouTube videos. And as we were talking about previously, that YouTube video that's created that's generated so much interest recently is certainly not a professional nor sanctioned uh, piece of uh, video communications. So again, it's a very, very important to understand um, exactly who's creating what, where it's being shared, and the volume and the gravity that that uh, particular content is uh, drawing, because that can be reverse engineered. That can be the, the reach out program. These are the people you need to collaborate with. These are the people you need to be involved with. These are the people that you need to support, not ignore and do a government communications only program or an official, oh, we only speak to the news channels because that's not where most of the consumers are getting their content from. And if we look at the competition and the, the results um, for the first page results, you know, what is getting people's attention? And we can see that, you know, there's 300 million search results if you type in just in Australia, Bali, and we can see what comes up. So you can see there, none of those pages or those websites on the first page are official websites in terms of news channels, in terms of governments, in terms of they're all private enterprise, whether it be Lonely Planet or they're free websites like Wikipedia. This means that the government communications and for all the investment for tourism and travel and everything else, they don't own the eyeballs nor the consumption of the average consumer when it comes to this destination. So again, if you want to get eyeballs, if you want to get um, consumption of your message, these are the channels and the people that you need to be engaged with or understand or have a strategy um, to, to help them share the information and help have them, most importantly, be involved in the process. And this too goes for the segmented audiences. So on the left, we can see the search results for news what's happening in news and we can see measles is a bit of a breakout uh, health concern in Bali at the moment and then on the right we can see videos because people consume things differently and again none of these with the exception of the news one on the left you can see it's an official news uh, result but the videos and certain those sorts of things for the most part um, again anybody can contribute to that they can be someone walking down the street and posting their own video and sharing with their friends but again, it's important to understand and know all of this before a major incident, because again, all of this can turn very, very quickly. Uh, much of it, um, you don't want to be playing catch up. You want to have a strategy to a degree pre-prepared, um, and you want to be able to target and be most effective um, in your response as it comes uh, sort of down to it. So 
just to sort of recap, the reason this is important and sort of evidence of that we know this for a fact is that um, with our open source intelligence uh, focusing on some of this um, sort of pre and post, um, we created campaigns for clients and one particular client, we generated over a million dollars of additional revenue in just three months um, by using and deconstructing these channels and pre-positioning our client to be consumed by buyers. So to validate that this is not theoretical, to validate that this is not just speculative or anything, this is cold, hard cash. This is dollars. This is the difference between an individual choosing to spend their travel dollars at destination A or choosing to spend their, destination, their travel dollars at destination B, somewhere that hasn't been affected by something, that doesn't have a negative connotation or just isn't doesn't present too many questions that the average buyer can't answer, so they'll go somewhere else. Um, so this is cold, hard cash. Now, if you extrapolate that across the industry, this is worth hundreds of millions of dollars to a tourism-based economy with a significant and sizable volume. Now, approximately 2 million Australians every year travel to Bali, so therefore, this is a significant and sizable revenue channel from a tourism uh, perspective, but it requires collaboration. It requires cohesion um, and consolidation from government bodies, from uh, the tourism industry, travel providers. It's a collective response, not just one or two individuals doing a little bit here and there. And unfortunately, that's what happens in many instances with the news agencies, uh, the news channels communicating, and then people independently trying to respond or um, you know, championing the cause themselves, it's not a unified approach. And unfortunately, many of, the, many of the representative government agencies don't understand the problem or they don't have the baseline. So this, this market analysis in terms of what is tangible and technical analysis based on numbers and volumes and breakout trends is an absolute must for modern communication engagement and response and preparation for supporting an economy or a destination that is that is based largely on on tourism or tourism dollars because sentiment opinion habits buying um, and cost changes are all factors that will weigh upon the buyers um, and if they're spooked if they're scared if they don't know or they've been led astray they will simply shop somewhere else So quickly looking at a couple of destinations that uh, skift.com have released uh, in May of 2017. Um, some detailed analysis on some of the destinations. Now, Turkey Turkey has been affected not just by terrorist effect, uh, events, but certainly political uh, changes, um, elections, um, and a whole host of other social uh, events. However, that has led to uh, a 30% decline in tourism. Um, in tourists, and it's down to 25.4 million individuals. Um, now, that is significant. Now, that's not just concentrated in one location. This is spread across the entire uh, tourism sector in Turkey, um, and certainly from an Australian perspective, uh, those travelling back to Gallipoli, which is part of our sort of uh, military historical destination, which can uh, engender as many as 100,000 or 100 and something thousand travellers um, during April um, has been significantly declined and certainly government travel advisories have, have contributed to this by saying don't travel or it's unsafe or there's issues um, or as I mentioned earlier breakout trends and in information the only time anybody's heard anything about Turkey in some of the consumer markets is when it's been negative or it's been a tourism a terrorism attack or it's an attack at the airport or it's a problem um, and as a result it's significantly and negatively impacted the economy. Egypt itself, again, not just isolated to terrorism, but a number of things in terms of um, the market itself has resulted in nearly a 70% decline in tourists for the first nine months of 2016. Now, increased competition from other competitors or the lack of uh, interest in some of their historical offerings or lack of diversity or just bad experiences from people that have gone um, in a social sharing environment have contributed to all of these facts. And what I mean by that is um, gone are the days of you know suffering through a bad hotel experience or a bad customer service or even a bad flight for that matter. 
everybody takes to social media and everybody can share their opinion and if it gets picked up and goes viral that can have a significant impact on on that particular service provider and certainly that destination Egypt in particular has not only been the victim of um, negative news but also negative sentiment and experiences of people have been there and just gone mm, nah, there's better better to be had elsewhere in some regards um, and as a result you know, there's been nearly a 70% decline. And this has had a massive, massive impact. So hotels are closing, people are out of work, um, infrastructure has been affected, flights have declined, all those sorts of things have a flow on um, significant and tangible effect to the location. And of course, France, as I've sort of mentioned a few times, um, foreign tourists decline just in the first half of 2016 to the point where the industry is now coining an industrial crisis is on the horizon for France because of the significant and sustained loss associated with the country in, in, again, not just one or two locations, but sort of broad spectrum because of um, negative uh, sentiment, because of terrorist attacks, but also th there's been a number of other things that have been breakout messages with elections and political instability and demonstrations, a whole bunch of other things. Again, often the only thing that people have seen or consumed which then affects their buying habits. And they go, well, I can go somewhere else. Um, and so much so, and we'll speak about it in a little, a little bit, is that now people are choosing to go somewhere else. So in Spain, for example, they're having an oversupply problem, is that they simply weren't geared for the sheer volume that, that historically they've had because many people who would have gone to France are now going to Spain instead because it hasn't had the same problems or it's not um, linked to some of the the terrorist-based activities that have taken place. So again, it's, it's, it can be a double-edged sword. Not only is um, there a diminished consumption or interest in some of these destinations, but sometimes that volume still has to take place. When people have holidays or when people get to a point where they're traveling or they've saved up enough money, come hell or high water, they're still going to travel. And if that destination has been removed from their consideration, they will go somewhere else. And that has significant concerns and problems too from a safety and security perspective, which we'll talk about later. But in this instance, um, it doesn't mean that those people have chosen just not to travel to France. They've gone somewhere else. And as a result, they've, they've lost significant revenue. Um, they've lost significant infrastructure um, taxes, um, providers, and a whole host of other things. So this is not just a top line, um, oh, poor France and their economy. This comes down to mums and dads and families and small businesses and, and buskers on the street and people selling flowers. It's a very micro economy aspect as well, which results in sizable losses, both at a, a micro level, but certainly very much a macro level. Um, and these can add up to hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Um, recently, in one of the presentations, the losses for the U.S. travel market, the U United States, in the wake of 9-11, took them nearly 10 years to recover and was billions of dollars in lost revenue from just the tourism industry alone. So often people don't think or consider that. Um, oh, the United States. Well, it is a tourism-based economy as well. It's a very, very big. It's both internally domestic as well as foreigners, but it took nearly 10 years to recover from the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Um, people stopped flying, and so therefore road fatalities increased because more people were driving. So there's much more to it than just a couple of these random numbers thrown out, and it can be significantly more sustained than a couple of weeks or a couple of months in the wake of a particular event. Okay, I just want to go back a step and talk about some of the motivators, the reasons that people are compelled to travel or why they travel in the first place. Because again, in isolation, sometimes people gloss over or they don't stop to consider this from a safety or security or terrorism related sort of vertical. Is that why are people traveling? Because the reason why they travel can be a significant influencer, influencer as to whether they will continue in the wake of negative uh, events, a terrorist attack and so on, or they may make a self-determined assessment that they're simply not affected. So if they're, for example, traveling for a particular reason that's got nothing to do with where the terrorist attack occurred or the people that were targeted, then they will still go ahead because eh, it's not me. It's never underestimate the ability of people to act in their own self-interest or what they believe to be important for themselves. So when we look at motivators for travel, the sense of adventure, wanting to go somewhere, 
again, you know, a little bit of an edge or, or uh, concern can sometimes attract a different type of traveller. But the whole idea of going somewhere and doing something different can be a very compelling reason. But if they're not affected by a terrorist attack or a terrorist incident, then they will simply go ahead. The culture, the environment, you know, the the, the lifestyle and the people and so on, again, is a significant draw part and draw card and maybe... In some instances, if one destination is affected, they may shift their destination to somewhere else, um, still within the same country. The food and the, the culinary experiences associated with a particular destination can be both um, compelling or repelling for some people, depending on <clears throat> where they sit with it. Um, and outright bragging rights of, I've been to this location, and look at where I've updated my social media channel, and look what I've been able to do, and and look what I've achieved on this particular trip. And, and there's so much invested in um, recording and sharing the information of, of, of any particular journey for most people, uh, particularly sort of the millennials and the Generation Ys and so on, is it, it all gets shared. So again, it's it's do they want to forego that and, and which has a, a bigger draw card, concerns for their safety or belief in the news they've been told or the bragging rights of going, so hey, I went to such and such for a week with my you know, a wife, my husband, a girlfriend, partner, whatever. Um, can can overshadow a lot of that decision making. Shopping, notwithstanding that you know a lot of people are invested in you know cheaper economies or or a range of products they can't find at home. Personal development, um, on the grounds that travel uh, expands the mind and they can see different things and experience different things. Um, sex and sex related activities and some destinations are tourism sex hotspots. Um, again, can be a compelling reason for people to travel in the first place and, and or education, um, you know, because they're traveling abroad, because they're going on a study tour or they're doing being involved in something or simply learning about, you know, their family tree or a destination or somewhere that they've never been before. Um, these are all individual reasons and it can be depending on the percentage or the volume of what drives their, their overall decision making. Um, the scenery and the scapes that they can see, the, the horizons, the landscapes, the hills, all these sorts of things may be very unique or specific to what they're after. Um, and that sense of entitlement of reward or reward in the sense that I've worked really hard, I've saved hard and I'm going to go on this holiday and I'm going to have fun and relax and everything else. And again, if, if that's affected or impacted, um, then that can be a significant uh, change uh, to their buying patterns. Medical, traveling overseas for cheaper medical procedures uh, is becoming a significant and sizable trend in itself, uh, particularly um, sort of on the global landscape with some destinations now being uh, primarily for medical tourism. You know, forget all of these other reasons. People are going there to get their teeth done, their nose done, um, liposuction or a whole bunch of other procedures uh, because it's cheaper or in some instances uh, better as well. And marketing, you know, what what is being communicated? What's being, uh, what have they found recently? Is it some sort of uh, coupon, discount, or offer that they've been compelled to act upon and they're purchasing, um, and they're locked in, or at the time of a particular event, is is someone very cleverly um, leveraged the event to promote their own destination, and therefore they're stealing um, buyers away from that affected terrorist uh, location. Um, in the wake of a particular event, because that does happen too. Uh, make no bones about it in the sense that um, your misery can be someone else's pleasure, and certainly in highly competitive markets, uh, we've seen it time and time again where the promotion of alternate destinations um, has been purely based on, you know, come to us, we're not affected by terrorists, and they are. Um, and that is more than a convenience in some of the marketing strategies that take place. Um and so this also then ties into the influences. They're the motivators, but what influences them, you know? So when someone's sitting down and starting to look at it and go, oh, well, you know, how many flights are there and what's the standard of, of hotels and how much does it cost and all those sorts of things, they're, they're making both conscious and subconscious decisions. Um, and a sense of pride or culture associated, you know, whether they're amenable to it or they're they're adverse to it in the sense that, oh, I don't think I'll travel to a, an Islamic-based country or, oh, I'm not sure because I don't speak English. And, and these are all considerations for consumers and buyers and certainly marketers that influence them in one way or another. Um, 
and the economics, uh, as I said, you know, what is the cost of a hamburger? What is the cost of a beer? What is the cost of a night's accommodation? Um, and very importantly, and this comes back to sort of the aforementioned elements, is when you're looking at the buyer persona and your consumer, you know, something as simple as a 50 or or $100 price point change can impact their entire planning um, because they've had cheap flights and cheap accommodation. All of a sudden, a visa on arrival introduction or a spike in the exchange rate or something that's going to take away from their, their uh, travel and holiday spending, 50 to to $100 can change their entire planning cycle and make them go somewhere else. And it's important to understand that, that that increase or that perception increase may not be terrorism at all. It may be, you know what, for an extra 50 to or $100, I can get better value somewhere else. And of course, public opinion. Now, I've touched upon professional and qualified advice. Unfortunately, in the wake of a terrorist attack or even terrorism commentary, there are all sorts of claims and counterclaims and just outright lunacy sometimes of content that is consumed or picked up on or shared both by supposedly respected networks and providers that is simply either not helpful, incorrect, or where did they get this individual or set of individuals? And it, it really is concerning. Um, some of the opinions that get shared um, and the support or the distribution that is then associated that can have significant damaging impact upon the both the, uh, the destination and it can be outright wrong. Um, and unfortunately, we've seen this far too often over the space of the last 12 months to a couple of years where... We don't know where they've got these individuals or they're forcing individuals that have got expertise in some area to then comment on this as an obscure correlation between expertise or experience, and it's not. Um, or they, sometimes they can just be a bad communicator, and as a result, the message is poorly positioned or, or um, transferred, and it can be damaging. Um, so one of the, the key contributors to uh, both positive and negative, uh, certainly are the news aggregators and distributors. If they get someone who is a poorly informed, poorly respected and considered or simply does not know, uh, that message can stick for quite some time and it can affect everybody adversely. Um, and in no small part, certainly the, uh, the news agency is who's then associated to who was that guy or that girl and what was it? Um, and, and unfortunately, um, that, that has contributed significantly. Um, desirability, you know, the desire to want to go to a destination for all of the aforementioned reasons, again, can be a significant draw card. Uh, the marketing, you know, the, the here and now discounted values um, and travel and tourism, where there is a mechanism in place or whether it is an off the beaten track opportunity. Um, and the infrastructure that support it, because despite all of those cost efficiencies, if there's just too much that frustrates a traveller, even though they're saving themselves 50 or or $100, they just won't put up with it and they'll abandon it. If the airport's bad and the taxis or the commute's bad and the accommodation's bad and, and there are no redeeming factors in the eyes of the traveller, then they'll simply go somewhere else. So all of these are factors that play into the decision-making process. It's not just terrorism. It's not just the terrorism event or one piece of negative news. It's a complex and supporting ecosystem that has to be considered. And again, communication to the specific reasons why something has affected. Something as simple as educating people on geography can have a massive effect. If we look at something like Thailand, which was affected by... Um, coups and um, disputes between political parties and a whole bunch of other things. If we look at the geography of where those affected locations were, 90% of it occurred nowhere near where tourists went or where tourists would commute. Yet the whole world assumed that all of Bangkok was ablaze and the whole country was therefore unable to be travelled to. That's simply not accurate. Um, and it wasn't communicated. The, the, the geography or the explanation of, well, that's occurring over there, where you're going over, is over here, that's 20 kilometres apart, or it's five kilometres in a capital city, and five kilometres apart in a capital city might as well be an entirely different city. Again, that was simply not communicated or understood or was too vague in the message. The rule of law in terms of how people are supported, um, you know, 
uh, particularly tourists, whether there's sort of a tourism mechanism to support and help individuals, or even whether um, tourists are preyed upon specifically by you know, uh, local forces and individuals or, or the locals get away with scamming um, tourists on a large scale. That, that does happen. Uh, the presence and the, the effectiveness is either the military or the police. Some people don't like to go on holidays or be reminded um, with people carrying guns and uniforms and patrolling around, and, and that can have a significant adverse effect, even though it may be deemed or appropriate in the wake of a terrorist attack, uh, it can be damaging itself. Um, things like emergency services, if I get sick or unwell, how does that work, and the standard of care in the event. So again, all of these can be considerations, whether it be because people have a, a pre-existing condition or whether it's just safe planning for mums and dads who are travelling with children. Um, all of these factors are part of the, the conscious and subconscious decision-making of consumers um, that comes to the forefront when something like a terrorist attack is then thrown in. Do they then look at that in isolation? Do they consider that as, as um, a sum of the parts? Um, or is it simply the tipping point to say, well, you know what, it was kind of marginal and now that's happened, we're not going. Now, terrorism may get the blame or it may be associated, but it could very well be many of these other aspects that are underdeveloped haven't been addressed or simply were forgotten and terrorism got the blame as a result. Um, the cost as well, yeah, again, these economics, how much can you get for your dollar? Um, the standards that people will either forego and certainly... Um, what we're seeing in the modern environment is a lot of hotels and infrastructure that, that hasn't been updated or isn't sort of new and fresh um, for a younger and new economies, particularly some Chinese consumers, for example. If it's not brand new or it's not uh, recently renovated or it's not fresh and, and by comparison, because most of the, most of the country um, in China is, is fresh and new and recently renovated, when they turn up and it's it's an 80s um, sort of infrastructure and it's outdated, not happy. Um, and as a result, the standard can certainly play to uh, the consumer-based uh, decision as well. Communications, can they communicate? How do they communicate? What's the cost of it? And certainly religion. Not only the religion in the destination, the religion of the individual, how pervasive it is, whether there's restrictions associated, um, or is there... Um, tensions or disruptions as a result um, of religious conflict or does it negate certain people and certain demographics or ethnicities or even the look of an individual oh will I be associated with this particular ethnic group all of these are individual considerations and sometimes further compounded by a group in terms of their family comment or their peers comment their friends comment oh don't go there that, that you're not welcome now that may be accurate that certainly may be far from the truth or government travel restrictions may be imposed that speak to all of these and individuals go, mm, you know what, we can simply spend somewhere else. So all of these factors, notwithstanding things like language, um, airline routes, um, the airlines uh, can be very, very sensitive to economic change. So as a result, they can shed um, service routes or in the wake um, can simply be adverse or if they were targeted they may cease to service a particular destination so whether you want to travel there or not you're simply not available how it easy it is of getting things done the use of credit cards versus cash and certainly the individual factors of gender and age and, and pre-existing medical experience uh, conditions and your own experience of sort of traveling all of these are factors and they certainly should not be forgotten. So you've got this as part of your fundamental analysis of understanding the customer. Who is it that's coming to these locations? Where do they live? How do they consume? What do they do? Understand them with, with specific knowledge, understanding how they come to form their decisions and how much of an influence terrorism is going to have to them. And having a message that speaks to not all of these elements, but certainly the dominating factors. So it removes the question. It removes um, the unknown factor for them so they can make a better informed decision. Um, and more often than not, it's in the absence of information or negative information, people will shop somewhere else. But it's imperative that everyone understand who the consumer and the buyer is first before there's any message before it's blamed on terrorism, before anybody leaps to. And certainly these very official government communications of we, the government, have got police and military, most people assume that that's going to be said. Most people may question it. Uh, might, may, some people may look uh, negative upon it. But 
it's too official, it's too non-consumer friendly, and as a result, whether it's accurate or helpful or not, uh, will simply get overlooked or be lost in the message. And media outlets don't like to, to continue to repurpose that piece of information. They want something that's helpful, that's useful. Dare I say sometimes sensationalistic as well, but they want something that consumers will use, not just a, you know, a usual holding statement by a government agency. It's, it just doesn't work. Now, a key component, both negative and positive, is the release of government alerts and updates. Government alerts, how one government perceives a location, how it informs its citizens, the, the tone in which they use, the message in which they contain, can have significant, significant positive and negative impact upon a tourist-based economy. Um, whether they're accurate, whether it's research, whether it's timely, whether it's considered, considered or measured. But most importantly, is that it's tied with travel insurance. So travel insurance, if a government's risk rating or advisory changes, then it may be the trigger for people to get their money back to cancel their trip. Or grounds for people to say, well, we're not allowed to travel there anymore and shift an entire demographic. So all too often we see ill-informed, hasty, incorrect government advisories released to their um, citizens um, or confusing or, or, you know, there's not a clear message in it, which then has a compound effect to travel insurance. They're then uh, obliged and forced to reimburse their travellers. And uh, we then get this change, this short-term tra- change, um, a trend where people have cancelled all their trip for the next couple of weeks um, and they've taken that money and they've repositioned themselves for another trip somewhere else whether it's within the region or it's a neighbor or it's somewhere totally different um, it has a significant compounding impact on the travel industry um, now they're always politically measured or filtered uh, in in many instances however the time the content and the means in which they're communicated um, can be significant and this then ties into the travel insurance. As I've mentioned several times, is that this can be the catalyst or the tipping point associated with, well, all these things considered, that's it, that, that's done it now, we're not going there, that's simply you know, grounds for not travelling, going somewhere else, or, oh, I told you so, um, or you know, it's that buyer's remorse. If there's so much can be invested in, in a holiday or an escape or a journey that that any minor risk, uh, regardless, it's like, no, 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 let's go somewhere else. Because again, this could be literally a once in a lifetime opportunity for some people, or a well-deserved break, or a lot invested. So it's an investment of both time and money, um, as well as their, their own safety, whether it be for them and or associated family, that all things considered, this event, whether it was a small terrorist attack or a big terrorist attack or a terrorism related incident, no, not going. I, I don't want anything to do with it. I'm going on holidays. I want a mental break. I don't want to be on edge and I don't want to be this and I don't want to see soldiers. Um, those are the sorts of things that, that uh, everyone needs to consider to contribute to because it's going to be first and foremost in the consu- consumer's mindset. So, and this comes down to the factor analysis. What exactly are the factors? What is the buyer persona? What do they look like? What are the decision making? Unfortunately, in too many forums and too many professional circles, everyone can describe the enemy. Everyone can talk about this particular terrorist group and these individuals and this is what they're after. Great. Describe the buyer. What's their average age? What's their income? What are they? Are they doing two nights accommodation? Are they going just traveling for a week? Where do they come from? All of the aforementioned factors. That's not the enemy. That's the buyer. And the buyer needs to be intimately understood and communicated to because irrespective of what everyone does downstream about the bad guys, what everyone does about you know the messaging and the news, if the buyer is not understood and the buyer is not con- communicated to, then the buyer makes their own decisions. And that is the net result of many of these events where adverse markets have been affected because the buyer was allowed to make decisions on bad information, on bad advice, poor education, or simply trying to get educated and educate themselves and reverting to Google um, and going all over the internet trying to find information, and they couldn't. So in the absence, they've gone, well, I'll go over here or I'll cancel my flight. Um, and 
it's a travesty that the industry or the tourism and the destination is so negatively influenced by something as simple as that, but it's all too often a repeatable folly. So what to, to consider? So from a, a government sort of tourism planning perspective, there's a lot to consider. There's airports, there's hotels, there's destination and all those elements. Um, but as I said, this is about understanding them in isolation, but also how they work collectively. So in particular, tourist segmentation relates to the most profound influences for most markets are the first time on new travellers and the regulars. Now, understanding what percentage of distribution they represent is paramount. So for example, 80 to 90% of your travellers to a destination may be first in new time. So therefore, they can be very, very sensitive to change circumstances or environmental factors and certainly negative news. So that can be a, a whopping 80 to 90% of your economy affected in a short term um, uh, time frame because you didn't own the message or communicate or engage them. Whereas the regulars, they understand, they're in for the long game. They're, they're the five-year trend, the 12-month trend, and they've been multiple times, and they understand things that happen, and in spite of it all, they're in love with the destination. They may even have you know, their own network of people that meet them at the airport and places they love to stay and places they love to eat and all those sorts of things. But if they're only 5 or 10% of your economy, then... You know, you've still got them and certainly don't ignore them, but they may not form the bulk of the um, the network or the relationship. Now, it's also important not only understand the tourist segmentation, but how that relates on the ground. If you've then got service provisions or tourist-based activities that are heavily weighted to one or the other, then that should also be part of the consideration because this models then your economic impact, where if 80 to 90% of your um, travellers and tourists are first-time travellers, and they're going to some of the cultural sites and they're staying at these particular hotels and this particular, you can project and identify an entire suburb or a whole subdomain of the tourism and travel industry that will be affected by one event because you understand the segmented audience. Whereas you therefore then can economize and don't waste time and effort trying to educate the entire world and focus on the entire market. You can just singularly identify those most at risk those most um, important and pivotal, but you've got to segment and understand the audience to begin with. In line with that is that there's decisions and timelines. And I spoke earlier about people make decisions based on availability for holidays, for example. So Christian-based economies may travel around New Year and Christmas periods and the Easter breaks. Um, those who are sort of Islamic-based, uh, Ramadan, the end of Eid, all those sorts of things, uh, Chinese uh, golden weeks, um, all those sorts of things need to be understood from the, the tourist-based cycles. Now, most of them are sort of understood um, on a yearly or monthly planning basis, but they need to understand from a, a crisis or a um, decision point, and that is the immediate. So the immediate market is anywhere up to sort of two to three weeks and they're making those decisions like whoa no 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 what not going or this has been affected or oh no that's 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 the tipping point or they're just too scared and they don't go you then got the short term which can be up to sort of maybe two to three months and then you've got the sustained new trend and that's sort of three months four months past so again, you've got to segment the audience, you've got to segment the time frame, and you've got to be prepared to engage the audience to get to a point where you don't find that after three months, all of a sudden your usual forecast, your annual forecast and your projections are all significantly altered because a new trend has been introduced because you lost the immediate market, short-term impact, and then therefore, the people have now just made a new norm and they're shopping somewhere else. They're going somewhere else. They're not coming to your destination. So each and every one of these three sort of key uh, markets need to be engaged. Now, the immediate economic losses are, sure, there's, there's occupancy rates. Sure, there's, um, there's uh, short-term losses in uh, some of the consumption-based areas like restaurants and uh, travel and so on. But short term, that can be unsustainable for someone who's running a, their own business. A restaurant can't go without customers for you know, a couple of days, let alone weeks. Um, in the wake of the Bali bombings, you know, nearly two and a half million people were unemployed that were previously engaged or employed in the tourism industry. That's not just Bali, that's Indonesia-wide as well. So 
um, that has a profound and significant impact. And then the infrastructure starts to get affected. And then there's layoffs. And then there's people looking for work. And then there's, well, is that hotel open? And is room service available? And all those sorts of things before it now becomes a sustained trend. Um, and there's less flights. There's less accommodation. There's less other foreigners. Um, perhaps the currency has now changed. All of those factors now contribute to the buying decision making, um, which can adver adversely affect a destination which needs to be engaged and needs to have its own message and be prepared for in various phases. So what do they look like? And these are just you know, atypical sort of stock photos. So again, you've got this immediate crowd that plan within days, you know, from the time of of inception to traveling to booking and even undertaking the journey can be a short timeline of days. And they're the most volatile or the most susceptible. And again, it's about understanding um, how short that time frame is. Or those that have probably got commitments or a longer planning cycle, it may take weeks to either plan or consider or review all of the elements um, and or those that may do it months in advance. So you've got these three different sort of verticals, again, the short of immediate dis uh, impact, the short term and the sustained, but you've also got these personas of, of how much do they earn? What are they interested in? How long are they booking? So it's imperative that you understand all of these phases and have a plan for it because you may survive um, or, or weather the initial impact of, oh no, bookings are down, everyone's happy, only to find that those who are in the weeks and months planning cycle have already made a decision to say, no, 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 we've got the opportunity, we've got plenty of time, let's now review and consider a different location and shop somewhere else. So even though, you know, in the wake of a, a terrorist event or a critical event, you know, that the preceding uh, or the, the following weeks, um, two, three weeks, everything seems normal, only then to have massive occupancy rates, to have empty flights, to have a whole host of other things because the message was inconsistent, it wasn't sustained, or it simply wasn't thought of in certain milestones in terms of the communications. Now, this contributes to the alternate destinations, which I spoke about, is that all things considered, it's a global market. So when tourists are spoilt by choice, and there's multiple um, offerings available because the airlines are offering deals and accommodations are offering deals. Um, or sometimes they can sort of say, oh, well, they're sort of comparative. I'm still going to Africa. I'm still going to the Middle East. I'm still going to the Americas. I'm still going to Asia. They can simply uh, arbitrage and select another close economy. Or sometimes it can force them to look at economies that are even cheaper. They may not be more desirable. They may not have even had information about them prior to this, but they've been forced to look at alternate options in the wake of a serious event or a terrorist attack and so on. Now, this is, this is also concerning from a planning and safety perspective is that sometimes, and I spoke about Thailand earlier, is that it was a, a huge sense of irony that during the disruptions that Thailand had gone through on a number of cycles, that people then chose to travel to other destinations like Cambodia and Laos and Vietnam and, and so on, only to then to have a medical emergency or a car accident or feeling unwell to then be evacuated or required to seek medical treatment in Thailand, in Bangkok, because it's a center of medical excellence. So what they had saved on and economized by going to these other markets, and Bangkok's by and large was empty at the time, but their hospitals were filled because it was tourists from all of these other alternate locations. Again, ill-informed, leaving it in the hands of the consumer or not providing sufficient resources um, led to some of this phenomena. So what response options? So as much as the travel and tourism industry is, is complicated and layered, um, what do you then focus on from a response perspective and how do you get the message across? So as I said before, um, communications, getting information out, narrow casting, speaking to the specific audience, to the specific decision makers, to the individuals that make up what is your faceless tourist industry are very much filled with faces and personas and specific individuals. Um, dealing with the emergencies at hand and communicating a sense of, of um, confidence and safety that the, the 
the event is being handled, it's being managed, there's resources, there's things in place, but keep away from being overly bureaucratic and government about it and, oh, we're doing this and the agency is collaborating. You know, everyone knows what a policeman looks like when they get on television and they talk about it because they all have that deadpan tone, that sense of disconnected, and, and that doesn't convey anything. That doesn't help. Um, use a different communicator, use a different medium, use somebody else or, or get somebody else to comment on that um, so as the message gets across. Um, the news and mass media. Now, I know a number of agencies and governments and so on have bemoaned how do we keep the media accountable, how do we police them. Well, the fact of the matter is you don't and it's it's time-wasting. What tourism industries and economies and governments need to get better at is communicating themselves is who cares what the mass media are doing if, as I spoke before, you get the message right, you narrow cast to the individuals, you can get your message through or use the same mechanism that a YouTube video became popular, you can use the same mechanisms to get through and cut to the consumer. Now, that may or may not be picked up by the mass or the, the, the news media themselves, but the point being is that you simply cannot sit around and and bemoan the outcome or complain about the media or, or be upset that they didn't get your message because if your message is boring or not on topic or not helpful then they're not going to share it um, but you can fix that and you can communicate you can communicate via Facebook you can communicate via Google you can communicate by all of these different verticals on a routine and sustained basis or certainly during a, a, a sorry an emergency Dr. Google, a phenomenon of people not going to the doctor because they've Googled their signs and symptoms and now they're treating themselves, this equally applies to the tourism industry, is that being that authority, that, that information, that informed piece of content that somebody acts upon should be top of mind and top priority for the tourism industry. Other, rather than some teenage blogger who's made some random comment that now tens of thousands of people have formed an opinion on, that's not a qualified opinion. The terms of reference, specifically how it relates to them, the association of risk, helping people understand how it relates to them and their own self-valuation or appetite for risk, and cutting through this living memory recall, because as I've said multiple times, is it may be the only time somebody's heard about the destination or, or um, the country, because you know, there's just so much news that takes place and advertising and content and so on, is that this could be the one opportunity to break through all of that, or it could be the only time they've heard about your particular destination. So you may have to make up for or correct a whole lot of misperceptions. And even as I said before, educate them on a degree of geography. During the Mumbai terror attacks, I had thousands of people wanting to flee India because they were in India. Well, India is a big place and Mumbai is not the only place in India and you certainly don't need to flee the entire country. But again, it was a lack of basic understanding, a lack of geography. These sorts of things then had to be communicated as part of the bundled message because you're now catching up or compensating for um, you know, people just being busy or focus, focused on other things. Aviation security in no small part plays a significant factor, whether you can or can't travel with your laptop, whether you're being strip searched and whether you can travel with, with water, and even how you're treated upon arrival. Um, all of these things are compounding elements. Now, in the wake of a terrorist attack, if these are overly onerous, if people are now being held in isolation and detained and that in itself, it won't be the terrorist attack that will deter the tourism uh, dollars and the buyers. They will simply go somewhere else. And again, they can get online, they can share with social media, they can make comments, they can make videos. And if their experience or the process um, and the draconian measures that are applied, whether they're appropriate or otherwise, can again significantly influence the tourism industry and um, certainly the economy. For example, just to sort of highlight some of the factors um, associated to where people have been injured and killed and, and uh, affected, um, looking from, from the US alone, you know, Mexico, Haiti, the Philippines, you know, over a two-year period, these were the areas that were people were affected. And the incidents and events, you know, the total volume of people that were affected, yes, it's tragic and yes, it's, it's um, preventable in many instances, but these are the locations that most people are likely to suffer negative events. And 
what actually caused it were things like homicide, motor vehicle accidents, suicides, drowning, for example, um, motor vehicle accidents, you know, motorcycles, you know, drug related, all of these sorts of things are, are far more routine and likely, whereas terrorist attacks and those sorts of things, again, remain very, very remote. However, it's a very big message, it gets people's attention, and people are compelled to act or change their minds and their opinions based on some of, of the information that's consumed. Whereas when you actually look at the data and you break through, um, Australians are no different. Um, if we look at sort of a five, six year period of where Australians, the top 16 countries where Australians um, unfortunately met their end, you know, we're looking at Thailand, Vietnam, Greece, the USA, Philippines, Indonesia, again, the, the sorts of places and destinations that are top of mind when it comes to terrorism, a lot of Australians are not even travelling there. And then if we look at the cause or the primary cause of death or injury, um, illness, natural, unknown, you know, murder is less than 1%. Um, so again, it, it's about understanding how often is this information conveyed? How often is it consumed? Very rarely. Again, if it's not top of mind, then individuals forget about it, don't know about it, um, and it, it gets lost. Um, from an insurance perspective, you know, what are people claiming for? You know, medical claims, loss of stolen cash and cancelled flights. You know, these are the sorts of things that dominate most of um, the claims process. Luggage, cancellations, rental vehicles, again, all of these elements are measurable um, and specific to locations. So these are the things that really impact people's travel. These are the things that, that like it or not, people um, are factoring in um, or they may pick up and, and anchor their decisions based on this information, whether it was new, old or relevant or otherwise. Um, but again, the facts of the matter are that terrorism still accounts for a very, very small percentage of both injuries and fatalities. However, it can destroy an entire tourism economy because of the headlines, the media, the press, or just the gruesome association of the horrible, ex horrible experiences and the, the pain and suffering and deaths occurred by the individuals affected, again, can have a massive impact on a particular market particularly if it's the only message coming out of that market or related to that market. So again, to sort of wrap up, things that we've looked at is the draw cards, the influences, the local economy impacts, the time cycles, some of the examples, measurables, professional analysis and terrorism. But above all, the takeaway message of this is A, the individual effect of terrorism still remains very, very low. However, you splash that headline out or throw that word out there and it can poison an entire destination or tourism-based economy, um, fact or fiction. It is in the best interest of tourism um, governments and um, aggregators of that particular market to understand the audience, to stop broadcasting, to narrowcast, understand your buyers as well as you understand the enemy and act upon it and have something in place and engage them and communicate them and empower them to make decisions. And then, and only then, you will have a sustainable model that will support both the economy, um, the interest for travellers, because you've given them what they need and that's something to make a decision upon. And in the absence of a decision or just nothing but negative content, the information and the decision made on the strength of that is pretty predictable. So again, from our perspective, we look and segment um, all of these particular elements and help people understand. It doesn't mean that they can't or they shouldn't travel, but the more they understand and they're able to mitigate some of those things by travel insurance or doing this a particular way or traveling a certain time or making sure they've got this in place. Um, again, people want to travel. Um, people want to consume and, and people fall in love with destinations all the time and they want to be a repeat consumer but put too many obstacles in front of them or make it just too hard or make it less attractive and they'll simply shop somewhere else. So thank you very much. Um, that concludes the presentation. Um, for any, again, as I said earlier, for any information or um, questions, uh, visit intelligenttravel.com.au or email us at support at intelligenttravel.com.au. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate any uh, feedback, comments um, or reviews. Um, on uh, the content of this um, and we hope you found it helpful. That's all for now. Thank you. Bye.